Please take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Going to be looking this morning at verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And as you're finding that in your Bibles today, uh, let me just make you aware of a couple of things in the life of our church that are very important. One is uh, something that we've already mentioned today, and that is this community picnic that will be taking place uh, beginning at 1 o'clock today. Many of you noticed that brightly colored tent as you came into the church parking lot this morning. Uh, this is our way of offering to our community just a place to gather. Uh, Taylor County has so many great and vibrant churches. Just a place for all of us to gather as church concludes this morning, not only from our church, but churches from all over our community. A time for picnic, a time for community from 1 until 3, and then beginning at 3 o'clock, the annual gospel sing here in our worship center. Really appreciate the cooperation of uh, the local uh, group that coordinates all the events for our Fourth of July festivities. We made some requests of them this year and just so great to work with. One is to have the gospel sing earlier in the day and the other is to allow us as a church to add an event to uh, already just a, a week full of great community events and, and we hope this will be an annual uh, time of celebration for the community to come together for the picnic at one and then the gospel sing at three. I want to express my appreciation to a group of individuals who has helped to organize the picnic this year and many of you already are signed up and ready to help to serve the picnic. If you have not signed up to serve, also just consider coming yourself to be a part of the event, just to be there to welcome those who will be our guests uh, this afternoon from 1 until 3. Looking forward to this, uh, again, as a way to say to our community, we love you. We love you in the Lord, and we want to be a blessing to our neighbors. And then the other thing, in your bulletin this morning is a special announcement from our Children's Committee regarding our church prayerfully extending a call to Jeremy Litton to become our minister to children. Information about this is in the bulletin today. Please take a look at that. That churchwide vote will be coming up a little bit later in the month, but we want you to be aware of it. We want you to be praying for Jeremy and praying for this search process. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. Before we read these words of Scripture together today, let me say uh, how great it is to live in a community like Campbellsville where the 4th of July is such a big deal and it's such a big event for us. I love this country. I love history. I love American history. Not only was it my major as an undergrad, but also even this past week when our family was on vacation, I, find, I found myself reading things about history. It's just something that I love, and it ju it's just uh, something that, that I, I really can't explain how much I love it. And yet, to look at our country right now, even as we give God thanks for all of the ways that he has blessed us and, 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 and how great it is to say, Lord, you know, in, in your perfect will, we could live in any country in the world and still be your followers. But Father, we want to thank you with grateful hearts that we get to be a part of this country. Even with all of that thanksgiving, we look upon our nation and our world right now and we say, Lord, what is happening? How do we make sense of what is happening around us? We've got a presidential election coming up. And, and again, as we, we had the prayer time this morning as a nation or as a church, we are praying for the Lord's will to happen for this presidential election. But so much concern being expressed here. And then changes in our culture, changes in what our government now tells us, changes in the very definition of marriage, changes in the use of public restrooms. And we're saying, Lord, how do we continue to be your people in the midst of this day and this culture? Have we ever had to face these kinds of challenges before? Well, I have, an, a, word, I have a word of encouragement for you today. Because these words from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, were given under the inspiration of God to a group of Christians who looked around and found themselves in the minority. 
And they looked around and found themselves under the rule of a government that was increasingly opposing the values that they stood for. In the midst of that governmental system, God has a word for his people. And it's the same word that God has for us today. So I want you to look with me, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. Please stand in honor of God's word. Let's look at these words together. Keep your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning as well. Listen to the word of God, beginning at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the emperor. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So how are you and I to be godly today? How are we to be the people of God? How are we to live out godly values in the midst of this culture and in the midst of this particular time? If you and I are looking for a word from the Bible that says, rise up, rebel, take up arms, overthrow, instigate, and do this, if we are looking for that word from Scripture, we're going to be disappointed. We've got to let the Word of God speak to us as it is, and that is as the authoritative Word of God. And what does it say to us? It says, be godly. Be God's people. But even under the authority of a government that is increasingly taking its stance against what you hold dear, to be godly means this. Godly citizens are good citizens. Pastor Mike, what do you mean godly citizens are good citizens? Uh, Does does this mean that we fight? does Does this mean that we rebel? Godly citizens are good citizens? What about those laws that are passed that restrict what we do? What about laws that are passed that are against what we know is right and what God's Word says? Godly citizens are to be good citizens? What does that mean and how does that work? Good citizens. People who are peaceable. People who are peaceful. People who love God and love neighbor. People who work for the betterment of others. People who work for the good of a community. And seek to be the very best neighbors that they can be. Jesus said, love God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. There were many people in Jesus' day, even amongst his own followers, who were looking for him to be that military hero, that political hero who could lead that change with power from the top down. And yet here's Jesus, Son of God. And when Pilate said, are you the Son of God? Are you the King? Jesus said, it is as you say. But then Jesus went on to say, my kingdom is not of this world. Godly citizens are good citizens. How does this work? Well, let me show you three things from these words of 1 Peter chapter 2. First of all, godly citizens are good citizens because it is the will of God. Maybe you saw that that phrase in this passage just a moment ago, but again, look at it. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. And here, Peter is not talking to folks like us who live in a democracy. He is not even talking to people who get to vote on who their leaders are. He's not talking to people who have a say in their laws or who can even peacefully agitate for change. He's not talking to people under that type of government at all. 
He's talking to people who live under the dictatorship of one man called the emperor. An emperor who was increasingly opposing Christians. And yet to them, the apostle Peter says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Look at verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. The will of God. Listen, you can know the will of God. I, I earnestly believe this. If you are struggling with the decision or, or what to do, if you're facing a fork in the road, I honestly believe that you can ask God the Holy Spirit. He will reveal to you His will. He does it. But there are certain times in Scripture when we get these basic principles that are the will of God for every single follower of Christ. For example, it is the will of God that you share Jesus. That's God's will. It is the will of God that any church be engaged in mission. It's the great commission that Jesus gave. We don't have to figure these things out. We already know what God's will is. And here's another. It is God's will that you and I be good citizens. For example, it means that we follow the law. It means that we obey the law. And again, I'm not talking just yet about laws that, that we would look at and say, you know, what does God want me to do? We'll get to that in just a moment. I'm talking about things like, like driving the speed limit or paying your taxes or being an honest and decent neighbor to others, or exercising that right and privilege to vote. The things that make for a good citizen, that do not bring into conflict our biblical values, these are the things that we do. The very will of God. I think oftentimes we're tempted to just kind of sit back and let it happen. Sometimes we're tempted to say, well, what good would my voice do or what good would my vote do or, or should, I really, should I really make my voice be heard on this particular moral issue that is facing our community? The temptation is to go with the flow, to simply let it happen because we might even think, well, it's going to happen anyway. What could my voice change? That's not being a good citizen. A good citizen is one who speaks up. A good citizen is one who says, you know, for the good of my neighbor, for the good of my brother or sister, I must speak up about this moral issue or about this decision. It's what good citizens do. And you and I don't have to figure this out. Should I do this? God, do you want me to do this? He says, look, I'm telling you plainly in my word, when you are a good citizen, you're doing my will. Notice Peter goes on to say the reason why. He says, verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Part of this is our witness. But when we are good, decent, honorable members of our community, some people might be surprised. Some people might assume, well, those Christians have their mind set on heaven so much that they are no earthly good. Would a Christian really be concerned about who I am or, or what our neighborhood is like or what our community is like? And for a man or woman of God to stand up and say, yes, this is the right thing to do. Or to simply offer a picnic to our community free of charge, expecting nothing back in return. Why would a group of people ever do such a thing? Because it's what good neighbors do, and it's what good citizens do. To be a people of peace, to be law-abiding, to be those who help others. This is the will of God. It's what God has already told us that he wants us to do. It's the will of God. Now, listen. Some of you are saying, well, okay, Pastor Mike, well and good. If, if, it's, if it's obeying things like speed limit and paying taxes, I get all that. But you know what about those times when a law is passed that is against our principles? Or what about that issue that is before us and we know that if we are going to obey that law, we are going to disobey God? What should we do then? Well, notice the passage also says that godly citizens are good citizens for the sake of God. 
Look back at verse 13. Before Peter gets into anything else, he is very careful to say, and we, we need to hear this. Verse 13, be subject, right? Submit, live under the authority, right? Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. For the Lord's sake, in other words, according to the Lord, for the Lord's glory, in obedience to the Lord, live under authority. What it simply says is that you and I always know of our higher authority. You and I always know that regardless who the president is or who the next president will be, we have a king in heaven who reigns forever, and he is the one that we ultimately follow. It's the Apostle Paul in Philippians when he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and that is where we look for our ultimate well-being and our ultimate blessing. For the sake of God, we are godly citizens. This means that we do speak up. This means that we do look for what is best for our neighbor. And yes, if there ever is a conflict, again, heaven forbid, the Lord forbid that we ever have a conflict where the government issues an order and we say, you know what, I've got to make a choice. I have to choose whether I follow God or follow the government. Which should I do? Of course, you and I follow God. We must. But even in that action, we do so in a way that respects authority. Pastor Mike, how does that work? How how could that possibly happen? Well, we've got some instances in Scripture where it takes place. For example, in the book of Daniel, we've got a story where the government issues a law that the people of God cannot follow. King Darius issues a law saying that everyone in his empire must fall down and worship a statue in his image. To worship that false image, to worship an image of an earthly king, God's people could never do such a thing. But King Darius issues the law. And here you've got Daniel, a man of God, living under authority, a model citizen, a good citizen, so much so that in the Persian Empire, no one save the king himself had more influence and power than Daniel. He was the model citizen. But when this law was enacted, Daniel already knew what he must do. There was no way that he was going to follow that law. There was no way that he could obey that law. And so he broke it. He broke the law. And in Daniel chapter 6, we find out what happens. They come for him. The authorities come for him. And what do they do? They arrest him. And they arraign him. And never once does Daniel flee. Never once does he protest. Never once does he fight against those who have come to arrest him. As a man of peace, he fully obeys the law so that when he breaks it, he confidently takes the consequences. And it's in this story that we find Daniel cast into the den of lions. King Darius doesn't want to see it because he knows what a great advisor Daniel is. Darius does not want to lose him. And so it's as if the king says, Daniel, if you'll just bow down and worship the statue, we'll forget everything and I won't lose you. But Daniel stands on his convictions and he is cast into that den of lions. But many of you know the rest of the story. By the end of Daniel chapter 6, the realization is they go back to that den and understand that Daniel is still there. The Lord himself shut up the mouths of those lions. Daniel is brought back out. And all that King Darius can do is give praise and honor to Daniel's God. What did this man do? Living under human authority, he gives praise and honor to the Lord. A good citizen. For the sake of God. And then notice this last one, guys. I've lost connections. Let's go to the last one. We are good, godly citizens are good citizens, finally, for the glory of God. And you might be wondering, well, where's the glory of God in all of these verses? Because we're talking about things that we do in community, things that we do day by day. Where is the glory of God in this? Well, let me show you. Again, 1 Peter 2, beginning at verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Look at verse 16. 
Live as people who are free. Now, understand this. You and I talk about the fact that we are free as Americans. We have liberty as Americans. And again, we, we acknowledge and give God thanks even for those who have placed their lives on the line for just the freedom to be able to worship God. But understand that when Peter wrote these words, he was writing to a people who were not politically free. They were not socially free. They lived under the despotic rule of an emperor. They were not a free people. Many people in the church that would have received this letter from Peter would have been slaves. They would have been economically in bondage. So we could say, they're not free at all. They're not free like we're free. And yet to them, Peter says, live as people who are free. What does he mean? Well, you and I get it. We understand that in Christ we are free. Christ has set us free, regardless of our economic or political or social situation. Wherever, wherever in time we find ourselves interacting with these words, even if we consider ourselves still in some sort of political or economic bondage, if we believe in Christ, then we are free. And Peter simply says, live as people who are free. We're citizens, living out day by day in community, and to live as a free person, how does it work? How does it happen? We wake up every day realizing, Lord Jesus Christ, you have set me free. You've set me free from sin. You've set me free from guilt. You've set me free from death. And the realization is that we can be politically free, but still be in bondage to sin. The realization is that maybe you call no earthly person master, but maybe you're still in bondage to guilt. Listen, Christ can set you free, and the Bible says if he has set you free, you are free indeed. So live as free people, free from sin, free from guilt, free from the bondage of death, all because of the cross of Christ and the empty tomb. And that's how you and I are to live. And when we do this, when we truly do this, and when we truly exude the joy of Christ that comes from how this grace has changed us, guess what happens? God gets the glory. God is glorified because it's his love on display. It's his grace that we proclaim. It is his son that we share. Not us not a political party, not a nation, not one country. No, it's all about the one Savior who has set us free for the glory of God. Now, this is timeless. This is timeless. And I'll be honest with you, with, with a lot of hand-wringing about what's going to happen in the next couple of months, you know, listen, I will pray and you will pray. We'll watch what happens. My family will tell you that even on vacation, even as I was reading about history, I was all, also kind of glued to the news, watching all the stuff happening politically in our country. I'm a junkie with all that stuff. I'll admit it, okay? But i got to tell you, I'm not anxious and I'm not worried. Because politicians are politicians. They do what they do. They are who they are. No more and no less. You and I have a better calling. You and I have a higher calling. We are to live as people who are free. Godly citizens are good citizens because Jesus is king. Father, we thank you this morning for Jesus on the throne, leading us, sovereign King and sovereign Lord. And Lord, may we as your people continue to keep our eyes focused upon you. And so over the next couple of days, as we celebrate and as we give you thanks for this nation of ours and the principles upon which we have been founded, God, may we never, ever take our eyes off of you as our King and as our Lord, the one who holds everything in his hands. And even this morning, Lord, if one single person would simply say, I want to be free today, free from sin, free from guilt, Lord, may we celebrate that freedom with even more cheers, even more gusto, because a soul has been set free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.